Well, ethnomusicology, uh, nothing attracted me to it specifically, to tell you the truth. Um, things have changed tremendously <laughs> since the 1990s when I first arrived to the United States to study. Uh, but back then it was a little bit different. <clears throat> I gotta say that as an immigrant, what I perceived was a certain sort of, it was an environment, an academic environment, uh, hinging on an anthropology of difference of sorts. And uh, as an international student, uh, that put me in a specific position. On the one hand, I was perceived as, a, you know, rightfully so, as a middle class privileged subject, uh, which I was by my, my American peers. And therefore, as a sort of, you know, middle class person, I was seen being Mexican with a suspicious type of agency. I mean, I had access to the culture and tropes of imperialism, mm -hmm. and I was constituted by desire, of course. Um, yet in American academia, which was to me the object of desire, being positioned by it in this way made me aware of this, sort of, of this colonial imprint of sorts. And uh, from that moment when I realized that I felt I was put in a double type of dislocation or a sort of double displacement here in the US. On the one hand, I was being dislocated from, you know, the class conflicts that constituted me as a middle class subject, you know, in Mexico, which were part of a, of a national project, of a cultural project and its political narrative. And here in the US, I was, n I was not American either. So I had to be turned into a subject who could become capable of academic strategy towards academic study according to American perception. But also, at the same time, I had to become, or I was to become an other who would be positioned as such in the job market, enter you know, diversity and inclusion. So that put me in a very interesting position. And I think that that unsolicited, but likely unavoidable encounter and positioning is what introduced me to ethnomusicology as a field of inquiry. So I would say that more than an object of study, I uh, was driven by that experience and that led me to ask questions mm -hmm. rather than focus on an object. Um, I came here to study performance, uh, first of all. Uh, my undergrad was in guitar performance and uh, I came to study to the University of Texas. Um, uh, that was in 1993. Oh, maybe I have to think about it for a little while. 1993, 1994, get a little bit for political reasons that I could mention later. But anyway, I came to study here and I, like maybe like many other naive people, I wanted to be the best guitarist in the world. And uh, that was what drove me to just practice, 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 go to study, you know, get straight A's as much as possible. But I did not want to go into conservatory uh, for no other reason that I really, I cannot explain to you why. But at that moment, I remember that I really wanted experience, educationally speaking, of a university with you know which had a curriculum in the humanities or that's what distinguishes it from the conservatory among other reasons of course so i wanted that and um being an international student of course you know you're told well you don't know how to write in english you don't know how to you know which is true actually i didn't i didn't know what an essay was well the basic structure of an essay <laughs> so uh, I needed to take classes on that. And there was a class for, you know, international students on rhetoric and composition. And one of the first texts that we read was in Gugi Wationgo's Decolonizing the Mind. And that book was, uh, uh, I, I, from that moment on, I was not the same. Uh, reading someone, you know, that was talking about certain experiences that of course you know, were alien to me, but he was talking about decolonizing the mind in certain respects. He started to, you know, make me think about what I was undergoing at that moment, certain experiences that I was having here in the States. So with that, you know, that, that was the backdrop. I finished the degree eventually, and I wanted to go into, you know, musicology. Uh, I wasn't sure it was musicology or ethnomusicology. I knew I wanted to do something on, you know, music and nationalism, because that's something that had me, you know, that had crumbled uh, culturally and politically where I was coming from. So that made me go into musicology, and um, I wanted to do Latin American studies. Therefore, I didn't want to go anywhere else because we had Gerard Behag at that point. We uh, we had the Institute of Latin American Studies at UT Austin, and it was a perfect environment, I believe, at that moment to pursue that. So I stayed there, and um, 
it was at that moment when I started to, you know, well, see another facet of, you know, academia that as an undergrad I had, you know, not been exposed to. And uh, one of those things involved the ensembles. <laughs> um, uh, so that's something that made me even question more what I thought I knew because I was told, well, you want to, for example, you want to, I was told, you know, when you take mariachi music because you're from Mexico, it's like, okay, well, that's not racist, but okay. <laughs> um, but what, what it was surprising to me is that, you know, I, I was told, well, you know, you want to take this class, you have to, you have to register. And to me, in my mind at that point, still, I, I was asked to pay money for something that I did in a completely different fashion for different occasions in a different context in Mexico. This, it, it, it just didn't fit in my logic. And that's, that was the first, it was the first introduction to the dislocation that I mentioned before. And well, as a grad student at the University of Texas, um, I gotta say, you know, that the program, uh, uh, setting aside the ensembles for one, uh, for one moment, it was undergoing a period of professorial change. And with that, of course, tensions between, you know, a new incoming generation of, um, of scholars with new ideas. And of course, you know, uh, people with, you know, certain set values, of course. And, um, well, that, uh, that of course affected a lot of us, a lot of you know students. Um, curric curricularly speaking, some of us felt that you know there was not so much of difference in terms of you know at a master's level perhaps between what we were getting in the undergrad and in grad school, except for the bibliography, and <laughs> we were given a bibliography. Um, so I was really looking for something with you know more. Uh, at that point, I called it historical depth. And but I was not aware that you know I just really needed to theorize more. I didn't know what critical theory was at all. And it was until I was told, well, you have to take a class on ethno, so why don't you take this class? And the class was called Music and Globalization, uh, taught by Veit Erlman. And that class I remember vividly. It just opened up my head like a watermelon, just splitting half. Um, it, you know, all of the readings were way above my head as an incoming performance student. And also I had to say that, you know, the approach to it, it was very different from how seminars are taught today. You know, at that point um, in the 90s, uh, Erman would come into class and say, Frederick Jameson's um, um, physical postmodernism or the logic of late capitalism, the cultural logic of late capitalism, not the article version, the book. <laughs> You have one week to read it, you know, and we come to discuss it. And every week was a different monograph, mm -hmm. you know, and that that was a reality. <laughs> that actually happened. It, it, it was pretty much sink or, sink or swim type of thing. So that class was not about an object of study. It was about, you know, uh, different thick issues and really transformed the political frame of inquiry that I had at that moment. So it made me search for methods and theories in other fields outside of musicology. I started to take classes in the medieval department because I was doing something with manuscript study at that point and writing. It made me go into the history department, you know, anthropology, sociology, actually. And I was encountering, you know, readings and methods from political science, from cultural anthropology for, of course, at that point being really important, cultural studies, media studies. So that single class really, I got to say, it was one of the things that really, really affected me in terms of my upbringing and the type of questions that I will be asking later. Well, because of all of this, I was always interested, I guess, I was interested in an analysis of colonial power or of power, period. And, of course, of the political negotiations to position oneself in, you know, a specific sort of, you know, political narrative of sorts. Uh, when it came to colonial Latin America, my study, it was about studying the reproduction of race as a sign of difference, which was always in relation to enfranchisement and in relation to the making of the public sphere in the very Habermasian uh, type of notion. Um, my so, my first book on in colonial studies was an effort to just begin to tease that out, to, to tease out how others who were being otherized were positioning themselves. 
So what I realized though at that moment, and now I'm going to modulate into another project, is that still, while certain political narratives had collapsed and things were undergoing a period of change here in the US, um, culture continued to be commodified in a sort of symbolic economy to signify what Mexican was, right? Um, in the US and in Mexico. In Mexico, there was also such traffic, but it was a little bit different. There was an anxiety to resignify what Mexicanness ought to be. And they were using in different regions symbologies, like music styles, practices, that came, however, from transnational encounters. And that to me became very, very interesting. You know, uh, I, rem I remember vividly in the city where I am from, how Colombian music had become recognized by the state as an expression of Mexican culture. Uh, you make of that what you want, but to me it was really, really shocking. You know, Colombian, co Colombian culture or Colombian repertoires practiced in Mexico becoming national expressions of Mexicanness. So that particular sort of phenomenon drove me to explore that issue of Mexicanness in which the nation state is pretty much undergoing the pressures of neoliberalism. The center in the nation came out of that, you know, with that inquiry. Well, I gotta say until today, <laughs> there are two that are very dear to me, and that's because of the the work that I, the type of work that I have put into it and the people that I have encountered in it. One is, of course, the volume, the edited volume, the center in the nation, because, uh, not only because it was, I was highly personally invested in it, but also because I had, um, I don't wanna call it privilege, but because it was, it was also a pressure. <laughs> Um, to be editing or to be trusted with editing the work of people that I really, really admire. Um, to have been able to procure, you know, Chela Sandoval to write a preface for the for the book. And she trusted me with editing her work uh, all throughout. Um, I don't know, it was really, really special. And that's just one person, you know, uh, Professor Alejandro Madrid, uh, Alex Chavez, other, other contributors. To have been able to be their editor was something that I, I really cherished. The other one has been the participation in the Committee on Academic Freedom and Professional Responsibilities of the Modern Language Association. Because uh, it has not only given me the opportunity to be in close exchange with people like Judith Butler, Gayatri Spivak, uh, people, you know, that have made a huge difference in, you know, whose writings have, you know, redirected my thinking a lot. It is also because in that committee we have been really invested in producing instruments, documents, um, a referenda of different sorts, again, you know, points of inequity or uh, trespasses to academic freedom that have been, you know, that have been happening as of late in the last three years. Uh, my engagement with the committee has not been very long, has been only for one and a half years. But uh, in that in that time, I have been able to produce, you know, put, in, put on paper ideas that we hope, we hope we have an impact as they are, be, you know, being used by colleagues in other universities as they, as they become spread out. Well, let's put it this way. Um, I feel that the question is looking for a justification of the disciplines, of the discipline, I'm sorry. So why pose the question otherwise? <laughs> but let me say this, I believe that right now, and I don't know, m other people might feel differently, but I do feel that there are currently deep problems with the readjustment of global players and with the cultural transformations happening because of the accelerated traffic of practices, meanings, and people, you know, in different in different countries. That is that is the truth. In some places, they're trying to imagine the future, and in some others, they're trying to look back at the past in search for renewed greatness. So there is a level of readjustment that is happening right now, and inclusion tends to be part of these landscapes, uh, sometimes uh, not necessarily for the sake of democracy or more democratic sort of participation, but for the sake of renewing institutions and for the sake of revalorizing them politically. 
meaning if they're inclusive, they're ethical, right? So they can pretty much reposition themselves. I believe that in this landscape, and given the institutionalized interests that are at stake, I think that an earnest study of the politics of difference and the mechanisms that make difference a point to reproduce inequity is something that is very, very necessary. And I do believe that ethnomusicology can be a very productive avenue to explore that.